Okay, you're very welcome to the annual Distinguished Lecture 2020. I'm Charles Mahoney. I'm the head of the School of Law here at NUI Galway. And I am delighted on behalf of myself and my colleagues to welcome you to this event. Uh, this is the 10th annual Distinguished Lecture. And we're delighted that the Honorable Mr. Justice Gerard Hogan, Advocate General of the Court of Justice of the European Union is giving um, the lecture this year. Um, very distinguished jurists and scholars have delivered this lecture in the past including, but not limited to, Baroness Hale um, of the UK Supreme Court with the Honourable Mrs. Justice Catherine uh, McGuinness of the Supreme Court at the time, Judge Shearfra O'Leary of the European Court of Human Rights, and most recently, Justice Leona Theron of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. We have over 600 people registered for the annual Distinguished Lecture this evening, and we had to actually close registration yesterday because we had so many people looking to attend. Uh, in fact, if we were to have this event in person, we probably would have uh, needed Pierce Stadium to provide for social distancing if we were to have this in person. Of course, the level of interest in this event is not surprising given the quality of this year's Distinguished Lecturer and indeed the topic itself. Um, the paper is most impressive and we will be able to circulate the full paper which runs to 20,000 words after this uh, event this evening. Judge Hogan's contribution, or perhaps I should say Advocate General Hogan's contribution to Irish legal, legal scholarship is perhaps best described as gargantuan. His research has spanned many different areas, including administrative law, constitutional law, political violence, and the law in Ireland. In addition uh, to all of this, he produced uh, what is really the seminal work on the origins of the Irish constitution, 1928 to 1941, published a number of years ago by the Royal Irish Academy. Judge Hogan, throughout his, through his excellent scholarship and his judgments, has made really an invaluable contribution to the law, our understanding of the law, legal history, and our constitution. And I think what's particularly notable about Advocate General Hogan is his willingness to communicate effectively, both from the bench and through his written judgments, but also from the lecture podium. His continued contribution to scholarship since his elevation to the bench and his generosity in continuing to take up the mantle of legal educator um, is really admirable. And he really helps us to develop our understanding and our collective understanding of the law and constitutional law in particular. The School of Law's annual distinguished lecture plays an important role in further enriching our students' learning experience. And I think that's all the more important this year as students have a really challenging year, the past year and the, this semester as well, in adapting to the new online learning environment. Normally we do hold this event on our beautiful campus in the west of Ireland, where we also have the opportunity for an informal reception afterwards where students get to meet the distinguished lecturer and the alumni of the school and the friends of the School of Law. Hopefully in 2021, the annual distinguished lecturer will allow for an in-person event and we can dispense with the notion of social um, distancing. Before I hand you over to the chair um, for this uh, lecture, I wanted to share some good news stories with you from the law school over the past number of months. Um, firstly, I'd like to just uh, acknowledge that the School of Law was ranked 85th in the world for law in the 2021 Times Higher Education World Rankings by subject. Um, this ranking recognizes, I think, the school's commitment to delivering world-class teaching and research that really informs um, national and international law reform and policy deba public policy debates. Um, some other good news is that our new moot court room for students will open in early 2021, and the construction of that will be finished in the next couple of weeks. And the final other bit of good news is that we uh, I'm delighted to just um, announce that we will have a new executive dean for the College of Business, Public Policy and Law, that is Professor Geraint Howes, who will be joining us in January. Um, Geraint um, is currently Professor of Commercial Law and Associate Dean in Humanities for Internationalization at Manchester University. So I really look forward to welcoming, welcoming Geraint to Galway in January, and Geraint is actually attending the annual Distinguished Lecture here this evening. I would also like to take this opportunity to um, thank Professor John McHale, the outgoing uh, Executive Dean for our college for all of his work and support for the School of Law over the past number of years. He really has been an excellent leader and he has created a very collaborative and dynamic environment for us here in the College of Business, Public Policy and Law. <clears throat> 
I'd also like to thank our colleagues, Lorna, Lisa, and Mike for all of their work in organizing the event this evening. And um, I'm going to hand you over now to the chair who is Professor Siobhan Mullally. She is the director of the Irish Center for Human Rights and she is the UN Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons, especially in women and children. And my other colleague, Dr. Siobhan Quinlivan, who lectures in constitutional law in the school and who is an expert in equality law and reasonable accommodation. She will be moderating the questions and answers session at the end. I'll now hand you over to Professor Siobhan Mullally. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Charles, and good evening to everyone. We're delighted to welcome you here to the <coughs> annual distinguished lecture of the School of Law on a, a cold but dry uh, sort of sunny evening uh, in Galway. And we're really delighted to welcome Advocate General Hogan uh, to deliver this year's lecture. Uh, we're sorry that we can't be hosting this in person, um, but hopefully we will be able to return to in-person meetings in the near future. Um, Mr. Justice Hogan was appointed as Advocate General of the Court of Justice in October 2018. Um, prior to that, he served as a judge of the Court of Appeal and of the High Court of Ireland and was a lecturer and professor of law for many years at Trinity College Dublin. He's a graduate of UCD, of the University, University of Pennsylvania, of King's Inns, and of Trinity College Dublin. And he is, of course, widely published in the fields of Irish constitutional law, administrative law, and on the historical origins and significance of Irish constitutional law. He's written widely um, and spoken uh, in, in many universities globally uh, about the historical significance of the Irish constitution and of our fundamental rights jurisprudence and has often reflected on the potential of Ireland's constitutional text and uh, of the very rich body of fundamental rights jurisprudence, particularly on unenumerated rights, but also on the textual potential of the constitution itself. Uh, he has been a great supporter, uh, as uh, Charles mentioned already, of Irish academia and of uh, legal education and of students, um, including throughout uh, his period on uh, the Court of Appeal and the High Court and more recently at the Court of Justice. So we're really very grateful to him for this support uh, and looking forward to this evening's lecture, which is on the topic of re-examining the McGee, Norris and the X cases, landmark judgments in Irish constitutional law, reflecting on their historical significance, but also their continuing contemporary relevance to debates around the potential um, for fundamental rights jurisprudence to continue to inform how we think about contestation uh, on questions of rights, duties, and the role and limits of the state. So thank you very much, Advocate General, and handing over to you. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Siobhan. Um, uh, and it's a great pleasure and great honor to deliver this uh, uh, distinguished lecture this year. Um, I'd like to extend a special welcome to uh, all the uh, undergraduate students and the postgraduate students who I know have had such a difficult year already in terms of the pandemic and learning and so on. And I hope that in, in a modest way that this lecture may be of, of some assistance to you. Um, so if we can just start then, I'm going to work really off slides and um, I hope to navigate my way uh, through these various issues uh, uh, as, as quickly as uh, possible. Um, so if we could just continue now after the first slide, um, we're going to start with uh, the case of Griswold in Connecticut. And I, I suppose um, you could say that in many ways, law is the epitome of chaos theory. Uh, if you take the view that sometimes the flap of a butterfly's wings in Ecuador has effects all over the world, well, in a sense, law is a very good example of that because who would have thought that the opening of a family planning clinic in New Haven uh, in Connecticut in the autumn of 1961 was going to have such long-term consequences for the United States, that might perhaps have been foreseeable, but who would have thought that it would have such long-term consequences for Ireland? And here is one of the key protagonists, uh, Estelle Griswold, opening her family planning clinic uh, in New Haven in 1961. Now, we'll come to the, 
the great case of Griswold in Connecticut in a moment, but a bit of context here. That was a law which in some ways was very similar to the anti-contraception law which operated in Ireland at the time in which, of which more later, Section 17 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1935. Um, the, the Connecticut law went actually a bit further than ours and it actually prohibited the use of contraceptives. But the critical point of distinction between Griswold and the and McGee, which will be the first Irish case I'll consider in a moment, was that this law was regarded as really a silly law, one which wasn't enforced. And in fact, um, a, various plaintiffs before Miss Griswold had a great difficulty in getting the US Supreme Court to adjudicate on it, because previously, twice in fact, the US Supreme Court had refused to pronounce on the constitutionality of the US, of the Connecticut law, precisely because it wasn't enforced. Now, um, uh, that was quite different to the context in McGee's case, where the law was very much enforced, uh, as we shall see in a moment. So that's Ms. Griswold. And now moving to the next slide. Um, I, it's important just to bear in mind uh, the background of Griswold because uh, uh, the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution enacted after the Civil War and one of the Civil War amendments um, uh, contains this key clause, which I'd like you to reflect on. It provides that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And um, the American case law on contraception and abortion, and indeed uh, same-sex marriage as well, and many other social issues of this kind, rests really on what many people might think is a slender foundation. It rests on two interpretations of uh, key interpretations of the 14th Amendment. The word liberty uh, is to be read as beyond just simply detention or imprisonment. In other words, it's given an expanded meaning uh, as if something akin to civil liberties and not just simply liberty in the sense of freedom from detention or imprisonment. And also the word without due process of law um, has to be read as not just simply a procedural guarantee, what we might regard as fair procedures or due process, not just simply that, but also that has certain substantive restraints on the exercise of legislative power. So a key to understanding the American case law is that the word liberty has been extended to reach into rights not specified, certainly not directly or expressly specified in the US Constitution, such as privacy or personal autonomy, on the one hand, and secondly, the phrase due process of law extends not just simply to fair procedures that you'd be heard before this right was taken, but it also extends to substantive constraints on the exercise of that particular freedom. So just I ask you to bear the 14th Amendment in mind uh, when we, uh, as we continue, because it's part of my thesis that the, um, in some ways, if we were explaining this to somebody with no legal context, and they looked at the relevant provisions of both the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution, on the one hand, and the equivalent provisions, Article 40, Section 3 of the Irish Constitution, one would have said that, in fact, the, our Constitution goes distinctly further and expressly guarantees a range of rights not found in the US Constitution, and moreover, and critically, it clearly has substantive guarantees and not just simply procedural ones involved in the 14th Amendment. Now, if we move on to our next slide, uh, we'll ask yourself, what was the basis of the decision in Griswold? Um, when um, Estelle Griswold was delighted to be prosecuted because it ultimately meant that her case was going to be uh, adjudicated upon by the US Supreme Court. And um, uh, the Supreme Court held, US Supreme Court held that the, uh, con the Connecticut anti-contraceptive law was unconstitutional by, by a majority of seven to two. Um, but what was the actual basis of the decision in Griswold? And this is some importance in understanding um, both the, not only the American case law, but also the later Irish case law. And as I've just hinted, the US Constitution doesn't contain any express provision protecting, for example, family life or the autonomy of the family as Article 41 of our Constitution does, or the protection of the person in Article 40, 
three two, or to use the words of the preamble, um, which Judge Henshi used great effect in McGee, uh, we don't have provisions providing for the dignity, the US Supreme Court or the US Constitution doesn't have provisions providing for the dignity and freedom of the individual. So in the absence of those provisions, the US Supreme Court actually struggled in one way in Griswold to find the exact basis upon which the Connecticut law could be condemned as unconstitutional. And the judgment really, the majority were split. Um, one view was that the right to privacy was either part of what Judge Douglas, Justice Douglas described as the penumbra of rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights, uh, specific rights such as uh, the, the Fourth Amendment guarantees against unreasonable search and seizure. And he went through a series of uh, individual provisions of the Bill of Rights and said, you can deduce from that a general right to privacy or um, a protection of the liberty interest protected by the 14th Amendment suggested by Justice Harlan. And that really has been the most influential um, interpretation of Griswold uh, since. So in other words, it's Harlan's view that the right to privacy is part of the liberty interest protected by the 14th Amendment. And it's a form of what we would regard as a non-enumerated rights doctrine of which more in a moment. But before we leave Griswold, just let's note what the dissent, the two dissenting judges said. Um, uh, one of them, Justice Black said, I like my privacy as much as the next person, but I can't find it in the constitution and therefore I can't say this law is unconstitutional. Likewise, the other uh, dissenting uh, justice, Justice Potter Stewart said, uh, he regarded the Connecticut law as an uncommonly silly law, but he said, I'm compelled to say it's valid unless you can point uh, to some express provision of the constitutional text, which was said to contravene, and he said, I can't do that. So let's move now from Griswold on to the next slide. And we come to McGee and the Attorney General. And here is um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. McGee, um, uh, as they, I think, prepare to go into the High Court to challenge the constitutionality of Section 17 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1935, which prohibited the importation of contraceptives. Now, at a formal level, it didn't go as far as the law in Griswold, but ultimately the majority of the Supreme Court would say that really didn't make a difference because that was a difference of only of, of form, not of substance. In effect, Section 17 prohibited the use of contraceptives. And that was the basis in which the majority of the Supreme Court ultimately held the law unconstitutional. So just moving from that photograph of the McGee's, um, uh, I think you have to understand the context uh, of the section 17. Um, the difference being that our law was rigidly enforced. Um, for younger generations and undergraduate students looking in, you might find that astonishing, but um, uh, the Ireland of 50 years ago was very, very different. And nobody in the mid 1970s was going to describe the 1935 act as an uncommonly silly law uh, as the dissent had in, um, in Griswold. It was rather exhibit A to the charge that um, the state had given effect to Catholic social teaching in its legislation. Now, at one level, McGee is the uh, Irish equivalent of Griswold, and that's certainly true. But in some ways, I think the fundamentally different context in which both cases were decided has to be also taken into account. Because the decision in McGee started a social revolution, uh, the consequences of which are still being played out and have been played out with us for the last 50 years. And in that respect, McGee, I think, is much closer to another uh, earlier decision decision of the US Supreme Court, Brown and Board of Education, dealing with desegregation. In other words, those were cases which were real life sensitive, acutely sensitive issues for the respective countries. And the decisions changed their countries irrevocably. And both McGee and Brown required real judicial courage and a high degree of uh, judicial imagination. So I think that's the context of which McGee has to be understood. Now, if we just continue. Um, one of the things about McGee is, is that we all, I think, um, believe we understand the basis for the decision and understand it. But um, actually, 
um, one has to go back and read it uh, and to see exactly what it, what it decided. Now, McGee is often regarded as a classic example of unenumerated rights in action. Now, that's, um, I don't want to dwell too much on the unenumerated rights doctrine because um, Ryan and the Attorney General would merit a, a lecture in all of its own. But in um, a, a decade previously, in Ryan and the Attorney General, um, Mr. Justice um, Kenny had said, and the Supreme Court had largely agreed, that the wording of Article 40, Section 3.1 contrasted with Article 40, Section 3.2, um, in, the use of the words in particular uh, in Article 43.2, uh, protecting certain specified e express rights, such as the right to life and person and good name and property, implied that the reference to personal rights in Article 43.1 was broader than that and embraced a range of rights which he described as stemming from the Christian and, and uh, democratic nature of the state. And he gave two examples, uh, famously the um, uh, the right to um, it, it, the right to travel, for example, and the right to marry. Um, but he also said in Ryan's case that the right to uh, bodily integrity was one of these unenumerated rights. Now, in passing, I would say um, with great respect that uh, I think Ryan's case has possibly distorted our interpretation of the Constitution. I'm not sure it was actually necessary for um, uh, Judge Kenny to put it the way he did. I think it would have been possible to say, in fact, that the right to bodily integrity is a part of the, an express constitutional right contained in Article 43.2, namely the protection of the person, uh, and that the unenumerated rights doctrine uh, is apt to mislead if you think that the courts have got a free ranging power to find rights which are not closely linked to the text of the Constitution. And um, uh, there are parts of McGee, especially the judgment of Judge Mr. Justice Budd, which are, if you like, classic, unrestrained run in the Attorney General approach to unenumerated rights. But I think that on closer examination, I think, I think I would suggest that all members of the majority, in particular, Ms. Justice Walsh, Ms. Justice Henshaw, Ms. Justice Griffin, were really applying what we would now call the derivative rights approach uh, found in the judgment uh, of um, Chief Justice Clark in a very recent case called Friends of the Irish Environment decided in July last. And now moving to the next slide. Uh, in Friends of the Irish Environment, um, uh, the Chief Justice set out the modern understanding of this approach um, uh, to uh, protection of personal rights. Uh, and that was dealing with the question of whether there was a constitutional right to protection of the environment. And he said, it'd be more appropriate to characterize constitutional rights, which cannot be found in express terms in the wording of the constitution itself as being derived rights rather than unenumerated rights. Uh, and he went on to say, for example, there's no direct right to privacy. Um, uh, there's no direct right to reference to a right to, to be inappropriately deprived of the ability to work. But both of these rights have been recognized, one in McGee and the other in a more recent case called NHV from 2017. And then going on with the next slide, you can see that um, he, the Chief Justice said, there's a sense in which the term unenumerated is not um, incorrect, um, but it, it con might convey the impression that judges simply identify rights of which they approve and deem them to be part of the Constitution. And he said, it's for that reason, he says that the term derived rights is more appropriate because it conveys that there must be some root of title in the text or structure of the constitution from which the right in question can be derived. It may stem, for example, from a constitutional value such as dignity when taken in, in conjunction with other express rights or obligations. And it might stem from the democratic nature of the state, etc. But he says it can't derive simply from the judges looking into their own car, hearts and identifying rights which they think should be in the constitution. Um, it, it must be derived from judges considering the constitution as a whole and identifying rights which can be derived, for, uh, derived 
as a result. And then he said, in saying that, I would emphasize that I do not thereby advocate a narrow textualist approach. And I think that's the modern understanding in terms of um, what I think more properly is called derived rights or derivative rights. Um, uh, I mean, if anybody asks me, not, not I suppose that they generally do, but if anybody asks me, I think um, I wouldn't, uh, with respect, advocate a narrow textualist approach either, but I would advocate a broad textualist approach to uh, the, in the interpretation of these provisions. In other words, that um, you've got to start with the text of the constitution before you see uh, what is either expressly or in one sense by necessary implication derived from that express text. So uh, I want you just to bear that in mind when we next come and look back with the benefit of this approach contained in Friends of the Irish Environment and let's look at what the Supreme Court actually did in McGee. And that's in the next slide. So um, <clears throat> I would suggest that insofar as the judgments of, in McGee rest on unenumerated rights, such as marital privacy and the right to found a family, these rights are closely aligned with or, or at least derived from one or more express constitutional provisions. So if you apply a sort of retrospective join the dots style approach, you can see that the case it is rooted in key constitutional provisions as follows. Uh, so there's references in the judgments of Judge Budd and Henshi to the dignity of the individual. Um, uh, that clearly is referable back to the pre very language of the preamble. Um, article uh, which Judge Henshi does refer to the preamble. Article 43.1, uh, an unenumerated right to privacy is one of the personal rights that's found, I think, in the judgments of, of Bud, Henshi, and Griffin. And that's the closest part of the judgment of kind of unrestrained Ryan and the Attorney General type personal rights. Um, but also in both the judgments of Judge Walsh and Judge Henshi, you find the obligation in Article 43.1 and really more accurately 43.2, the protection of life and person, because those are express guarantees in Article 43.2. Um, uh, a reference by implication to Article 40, Section 5, the inviolability of the dwelling and privacy in Judge Griff Griffin's judgment, although he doesn't invoke Article 40, Section 5, but he does speak about the invasion of the sanctity of the marital bedroom by this legislation, prohibiting the use of contraceptives, the importation of contraceptives. And Article 41, uh, dealing with the protection of the family and protection of marital privacy and marital autonomy, that I think you find from Article 41 and referred to in both the judgments of Judge Walsh and Judge Henshi. And then there is a passing reference uh, in um, uh, Judge Henshi's judgment to freedom of conscience, which is one of the express guarantees in Article 44.2.1. Although in passing, I'd also observe that Judge Walsh said that that really didn't apply, uh, he thought, because um, a freedom of conscience, he said, was in the context of religion uh, uh, and religious preferences rather than freedom of conscience in the broader philosophical sense of the term. But in other words, just pausing here in terms of McGee, it's, there is certainly a right we're referencing marital privacy and marital autonomy, which rights are not as such guaranteed uh, by uh, either Article 40 or Article 41, but clearly this is very much a derivative or a right style ap uh, approach that it's, it's very, th there's a clear connection between uh, the conclusion that there was such a right and the, and the text of the constitution in various different places. And of course, uh, I, I, just to say that once the court found um, that as the majority did, that uh, there was a right to marital privacy and autonomy, uh, that this right, that this law, which prohibited the use of contraceptives, it clearly offended that right for a variety of different, and, and, and to our minds, I think fairly obvious reasons. Now, just moving on, on, on now to the next slide. Um, the point that I, however, at this that I would like to emphasize is that the legal basis of McGee 
was much more firmly rooted in the text of the Irish constitution than Griswold was in respect of its US counterpart. Because, um, uh, okay, three judges based their decision on article 43.1, which is classic unenumerated rights. Um, and the strict ratio of McGee's case appears to be that the law in question was unconstitutional because it compromised our right to marital privacy deriving from the unenumerated rights provisions of Article 43.1. But as I say here, it, it scarcely matters because nearly all of the majority judgments were replete with references, whether direct or indirect, to key constitutional principles such as dignity, freedom of the individual, privacy, marital privacy, marital autonomy, life, person, the inviolability of the dwelling, and the autonomy of marital couples. And all of these um, specific references can be, can are either expressly or on, on this join the dots basis linked to to uh, express provisions of the constitution itself. It's also clear, however, that the reasoning in Griswold was influential with the majority, although it was only Judge Griffin uh, who quoted from that decision uh, at length. But looking at McGee almost a half a century later, what's striking is not only that McGee is more deeply rooted in the text of the Irish constitution than is Griswold with his US a counterpart, but also that the substantive provisions of the Irish constitution are in fact more protective in this regard of the substantive right to marital privacy and marital autonomy. And now if we just move on from um, uh, uh, McGee um, for the moment, now I'm going to just uh, dwell on um, the issue of um, both Norris and uh, Bowers and Hardwick. Um, but Bowers and Hardwick is a decision of the US Supreme Court from 1986, um, uh, whereas the decision of the Irish Supreme Court in Norris dealing with uh, legislation which prohibited um, uh, male homosexual, consensual male homosexual conduct, um, uh, that date dated from April 1983. Now, um, just before we look at Norris, let's, let's look at Bowers and Hardwick, because um, there if you like, there's another uncommonly silly law, if you want. But on this occasion, um, it, the, in comparison with the situation in Griswold and McGee, the tables were turned. Because in Bowers, the participants in, in Bowers were, the plaintiffs were prosecuted. Whereas we purported to make a virtue of the fact that our laws were not in fact enforced. Now, that I think is a, a gross overstatement and I think mitigates the damage which this legislation did to uh, the gay community in particular, uh, um, and that's set out in more, in more detail in my, in my paper, but just at a superficial level, um, uh, Mr. Norris had never been prosecuted as we see, um, whereas there was a prosecution in Bowers and Hartwick. And that's the kind of inverse of the Griswold McGee dichotomy because in Griswold, uh, they were waiting to be prosecuted uh, in respect of a law that really wasn't enforced, whereas in McGee, the law was actively enforced. But in Bowers and Hardwick, um, um, the US Supreme Court by majority said that the liberty interest in the 14th Amendment didn't embrace homosexual conduct. And uh, he said that um, the right to engage in such conduct to claim that the right to engage in such conduct is deeply rooted in the na nation's history and tradition or implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. Uh, that's part of the, the test, is it for whether it's protected by the 14th Amendment, is that it's at best facetious. Uh, but there's also, I think, remarkable echoes of the judgment of Chief Justice um, uh, O'Higgins in Norris in the concurring judgment some three years later from the then US Chief Justice Berger, who uh, in, in presumed ignorance of what Chief Justice Higgins had said some three years earlier, said, 
decisions of individuals relating to homosexual conduct have been subject to state intervention throughout the history of Western civilization. Condemnation of these practices is deeply root, rooted in Judeo-Christian moral and ethical standards. To hold that the act of homosexual sodomy is somehow protected as a fundamental right would be to cast aside millennia of moral teaching. And I only draw attention to this because Bowers and Hardwick has since been overturned in a in landmark case called Lawrence in Texas in, in, in 2003. Uh, um, uh, but I only draw attention to this because um, to refute the claim of, if you like, Irish exceptionalism, so far as Norris is concerned, uh, and there is an uncanny similarity between what the two chief justices actually said. But now we'll come to Norris next. And the next slide. So there's um, uh, the very well known plaintiff, um, now the longest standing member of the upper house and uh, uh, and he gave rise to uh, again one of the um, one of the most interesting decisions of the uh, of our um, supreme court in uh, april 1983 and let's move on now to the next slide and we'll see um, the majority judgment of the Chief Justice, which has been the subject of a lot of criticism. Uh, and it's probably um, uh, um, this criticism at a technical level that the as the majority as the minority pointed out that the majority judgment had failed to engage with the actual evidence given in the High Court. But the critical point was is that in a sense, um, the majority judgment is seen as reflecting traditional Irish religious come Catholic values. And, um, and there it is from um, the Chief Justice, he said, it cannot be doubted the people asserting and, and acknowledging their obligations to our divine Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming a deep religious conviction uh, and an intention to adopt a constitution consistent with that conviction and faith and with Christ and Christian beliefs. And then uh, it suggests in the very act of so doing, the people rendered inoperative laws which had existed for hundreds of years, prohibiting unnatural uh, sexual conduct, which Christian teaching held to be gravely sinful. Uh, and uh, he says, when you consider that such conduct had been condemned in the name of Christ for almost 2,000 years, and at the time of the enactment of the Constitution was prohibited as criminal by the laws and force in the United Kingdom, the suggestion becomes more incomprehensible and difficult of acceptance. Now, I think even in 1983, I think a lot of people had difficulty with this particular reasoning. Um, uh, I mean, it suffices to say just even two or three things in response. First, the fact um, one would have thought that in 1937, for good or for ill, we were adopting our own standards, repudiating the uh, the Anglo legal tradition and uh, the constitution was emphatically declaring the independence of Ireland. Uh, the fact that uh, a law or particular laws existed prohibiting this practice in 1937 uh, in the United Kingdom wouldn't have thought to be either really here or here or there. One point. Second point is, is that um, if these laws were uh, so uh, if the justification for these laws was that they reflected, if you like, religious thinking, um, well then, I mean, one would have thought that, the, I mean, it's singular that the laws only apply to male homosexual conduct. Uh, one would have thought it was just as much a breach from that perspective, and I emphasize from that perspective of the Sixth and Ninth Amendments, or sorry, Sixth and Ninth commandments uh, 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 for females to engage in such uh, activity. And yet the law um, had this very stark uh, gender divide uh, between males and females in that it was only male homosexual conduct which was uh, prohibited. And the other point as Judge Henshi in his dissent pointed out um, um, that if that was the case, how come the um, the Supreme Court had invalidated the anti-contraceptive laws in McGee's case because that was contrary to uh, the proclaimed um, religious teachings of the majority uh, Christian uh, tradition uh, in this state. So um, the majority judgment had given rise to a lot of difficulties and I, I, um, uh, it was criticized a lot then and I think has not um, Never mind the um, uh, 
uh, the marriage equality referendum, it has not, I think, weathered uh, particularly well. But now we just look at the, 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 the two dissents, and in particular, the dissent of Judge Henshi, and I'll move on to the next slide. Um, um, I, I, and sort of just before I do, some other critique of the majority decision, perhaps some context here, I think Professor Gwyn Morgan has put it well. He said, maybe the real ground of the decision was that the majority judges had decided that Irish society was not at that point ready for a change, whereas they had believed the opposite in McGee. And uh, I think also uh, uh, Naris represented one of the very few and probably the last example uh, of where a court had expressly uh, invoked avowedly traditional Christian or Irish Catholic values and where these values have played a role in constitutional law. Now we just move on to the next slide. Uh, we have the um, brilliant dissent of Judge Henshi, many ways, the greatest ever Supreme Court judgment, question mark. Um, uh, all members of the court, incidentally, were agreed that the Constitution protected a general right to privacy. They were divided solely on the question of whether a law criminalizing homosexual conduct between consenting adult males constituted an infringement of that right. And then, but where did that come from? And you'll see that Judge Henshi uh, in, uh, had to acknowledge that there wasn't a, such a general right to privacy, but looked at other provisions of the Constitution, which, um, in a sense, by implication, he thought, uh, uh, represented or protected the right to privacy. If we now move on to the next slide, um, he, he goes on to say, for, he gives the example of, for instance, Article 16, uh, recognizing the, the voting to, for the Doyle shall be by secret ballot. Uh, he also then referred to McGee's case, where it was a right to use contraceptives. Uh, and then he said, there's many others right to privacy, some to be given judicial recognition. Uh, and he said that they all derive from uh, the expression of an individual personality for purposes not always necessarily moral or commendable, but, making, but meriting recognition in circumstances which do not engender considerations such as state security, public order, morality, or other elements of the common good. And then this continuing. Um, trying to critique this judgment uh, in Norris, um, which is in many ways the best, arguably the greatest judgment ever delivered from the Supreme Court bench. Um, it's a bit like a modern musicologist critiquing J.S. Bach's Brandenburg uh, concerto. So you can see sort of one legal genius um, looking in the, that slide to another musical genius. Um, but anyway, let's try and look and do this critique. If we move on to the next slide, um, you could say that um, his judgment perhaps doesn't quite in all the doubts regarding the prov provenance of a general right to privacy. Um, you could say, for example, the reliance on McGee uh, was different in that marital privacy is of the very essence of marriage um, uh, and its particular form of human so association sanctified by tradition and culture and religion and one expressly protected by Article 41 uh, of the Constitution. Nevertheless, as I said, that um, the reference by Judge Henshi to McGee and specific instances of the secrecy of the ballot and so on um, has strong shades of the approach taken by Harlan um, in, for the US Supreme Court in his dissent in another, in an earlier um, Connecticut contraceptive case, Poe and Ullman, and in his concurring judgment in Griswold. So in the words of one US commentator, this approach refers to constitutional provisions, common law tradition, the court's own precedents. Uh, these were the dots or reference points, which when connected created the rough line outline of what Harlan called the continuum of due process liberty. And I say here, I think that that would be a sufficient link for most people in this joining the dots exercise to the text of the constitution. The Henshi analysis regarding the existence of a general right to privacy doesn't rest on the purely subjective factors, uh, which um, later, which uh, some 50, some what, 35 odd years later, um, Chief Justice Clark rejected in Friends of the Irish Environment as an appropriate method for ascertaining the 
true scope of the derivative rights for the purpose of Article 43.1. And so then continuing. Some of these join the dots have been added by um, the Supreme Court more um, in another very important case called Simpson and the governor of Mountjoy prison dealing with slopping out uh, from uh, this time last year and where Judge McMenamin referred to said that the judgment in Norris should be uh, of Judge Henshi Norris should not be now be regarded as having outlined the main contours of the unenumerated right to privacy. And he said the right is derived from the protection of the person to be found in the words of Article 43.2 and in the ethos of the Constitution as, as a whole, and in particular, the value of the dignity of the person expressed in the preamble. And then it, moving on to the next slide, we'll see that this is where Judge McMenamin says, uh, there's a close link between the constitutional privacy right and the value of dignity. The right to privacy and the value of dignity find their focus point in uh, the right of the appellant to be protected as a person as defined by Article 43.2. So you can see here the Supreme Court in Simpson uh, is very much joining the dots uh, uh, of a general right to privacy and but linking it uh, they're not saying it because they think it's a good idea, but they're linking it very much to the text and giving meaning to the text in this way. And uh, I, I would respectfully add, you, you might say that the guarantee of the inviolability of the dwelling in Article 40, Section 5, uh, um, because the sanctity of the, the bedroom applies to you know, gay men and uh, gay women as well. And you could say that the right of um, uh, homosexual couples to associate freely and consensually in an intimate fashion is also perhaps just as much a right of the par uh, right part of the right of association protected by Article 40, Section 6, 1, as is, for example, the right of a group of friends to associate and come together, if not indeed more so. So you can see that this general right to privacy uh, can be linked very closely in this derivative way uh, with the text of the Constitution. Now, moving on. And then um, um, looking back at what Henshi said in Norris, um, uh, here I make the point that um, the equality claim failed rather surprisingly, I think, because as I pointed out, um, if the basis for uh, upholding the legislation and the majority decision was that it was criminalizing unnatural sexual conduct with Christian teaching it held to be gravely for sinful, then it seemed all that the legislation would apply only to males and not to females. Uh, and also, I mean, this was clear discrimination based on gender, which uh, in subsequent case law has been a ground at least in which uh, other legislation discriminating on this gender basis has been found to be unconstitutional. So let's move from Norris, moving on now to the final case, and then the origins of the Eighth Amendment. And um, the, I think, um, whatever you stand, however you stand on the issue of abortion, one of the difficulties um, with, uh, with it uh, is that the US Supreme Court um, gave its decision in January 1973 in Roe and Wade. And one of the reasons why it remains so controversial to this day is because the reasoning of the majority judgment of Judge Blackman is so weak. And I think that's generally agreed, irrespective of where you stand on the abortion issue or where you think the US Supreme Court should or should not have found this legislation to be unconstitutional. The reasoning in Roe and Wade is so, is, is so weak. And the essential critique of that decision remains. It failed to dem demonstrate how it fitted into the Harlan due process continuum dating back to Griswold and even further back into US constitutional history. And here is a, a, a searing analysis offered by um, uh, Lazarus, who is a, a supporter of abortion rights indeed, was a former uh, clerk of, to Judge Blackman and admirer of him. But he says, look, the opinion's legal argument is stunningly brief. Uh, it said, well, the court decorated the fringes of its opinion with historical details. It left the center barren. 
Roe makes no attempt to find the contours of the right to privacy or its underlying principles, and he continues in this vein. And he goes on to say, the opinion equivocates even on the basic question whether the right is properly located in the Ninth Amendment, which had reserved certain rights to the people, or uh, and is never really ever invoked by the US Supreme Court, or the 14th Amendment due process clause. And his discussion of the state's competing interest in, in that should be fetal life is, is scarcely more uh, elaborate. So moving on from that, um, um, Roe and Wade had huge consequences um, uh, in, uh, for US constitutional law. And to this day, uh, it is um, a decisive issue, often in terms of US Supreme Court uh, nominations. But it had a huge impact in Ireland as well. And there was a debate between um, James O'Reilly SC and uh, Professor William Binchy in the 1977 studies, um, uh, where uh, Professor Binchy said, it's precisely because McGee wasn't concerned with abortion. It's not a legal precedence against abortion. Judge Walsh had made obiter remarks, but he said the concept of marital privacy, which McGee has imported into this country from the United States with little analysis is of such a pliable nature that it may readily be bent as happened in the United States to accommodate the recognition of the right to abortion. Now that was one of the intellectual underpinnings of a movement which later became the Eighth Amendment in 1983. And if we move on to the next slide. Um, the Eighth Amendment, Article 43.3, um, uh, the debate is the subject of would be hours of, of a lecture, but just let's take it as read that it was so enacted. But the adoption of the Eighth Amendment was initially greeted with silence in the first few years after the passage of the referendum. For a while, it looked as if uh, it was fated to join or come close to join other largely decorative features of the Constitution, such as the women in the home clause or the long deleted provisions of Article 44, providing for the recognition of the special position uh, of the Catholic Church. Um, these decorative provisions are or were ones which had little real juridical effect and had been included in the Constitution as an indication of prevailing moral or national values rather than as a means of bringing about legal rights as such. And in the paper, I venture the thought that I think that many people, certainly in 1983, would have been happy enough with Article 43.3 or the Eighth Amendment as a decorative feature to show that there was a commitment against abortion and to prevent perhaps the Supreme Court following the Roe and Wade example. But what they didn't really understand or want uh, was the constitutionalization of giving an active right to life uh, of the unborn, because that was going to create difficulties and difficulties came with it. So if we move to the next slide, The Well Woman case, which had prevented, uh, which the Supreme Court granted an injunction stopping um, the um, various family planning clinics handing out information about abortion services in the UK. Um, uh, and the later X case showed that Article 43.3 was anything but decorative. Now, one of the difficulties about the Well Woman case is that um, you could say, how did it fit in with the right to free speech in Article 40, Section 6? But it also seemed to fit uneasily with the right to life of the mother provisions of Article 43.3. How, one might ask, was a mother whose life was in fact in danger supposed to access abortion um, uh, services if she couldn't access basic information of this kind? But I would say that the well woman judgments at, at many levels were perfectly logical outcomes which reflected the preserve unborn life at all costs philosophy which was a key theme under underpinning article 43.3 and this ultimately came to a head with the decisions of the high court and the supreme court in the x case in the months of february and march 1992 and um we just move on to the next slide i mean the the facts are well known about this concerned a 14 year old rape victim um, um, where the issue arose as to whether or not uh, she wanted to travel to England for an abortion. Um, the family contacted the guard, the, uh, but whether or not um, the uh, DNA test would be useful in terms of a subsequent prosecution is ultimately filtered up through the system and led to the attorney general taking action, seeking an injunction, preventing her from traveling abroad. 
Now, the child was, as, as can be imagined, was psychologically distraught and communicated suicidal thoughts. The psychological evidence was that the danger to her of carrying a child would be considerable and the damage to her mental health would be devastating. And, but Mr. Justice Costa granted an injunction stopping the right, to, uh, stopping her from traveling uh, on the basis that he said there's a real and imminent danger to the life of the unborn and if the court doesn't step in to grant it by means of the injunction sought, its life would be terminated. There was a risk that the defendant might take her own life, but he says the, the risk was of a different order of magnitude than the certainty that the life of the unborn would be terminated if the order isn't made. And so he granted the injunction. And then moving on to the next slide, uh, famously, the Supreme Court allowed by majority allowed um, the appeal saying that the proper test to be applied if it's established as a, as a matter of probability that there's a real and substantial risk to the life as distinct from the health of the mother, which can only be avoided by a termination of pregnancy. Such termination is permissible having regard to the true interpretation of Article 43.3. And the logical corollary of that passage was that there was indeed a category of circumstances, however unusual or specific, in which abortion was lawful by reason of a real and substantial risk to the mother's life, as distinct from her health. But critically, a majority of the court left open the possibility that there could be circumstances in which an injunction could be granted to restrain a pregnant uh, uh, woman from leaving the state to secure an abortion. So moving on. Um, just to pause on the consequences, um, a large section of the public were deeply upset uh, at this, uh, paved the way for the 11th and uh, 12th Amendments of the Constitution, which safeguarded the right to travel and the right to obtain information. But in retrospect, I think you can see that the X case represented the beginning of the end for the Eighth Amendment, because if the earlier well woman litigation passed the, largely passed the public by, the X case struck a deep chord with the Irish people, irrespective of the actual result uh, of the Supreme Court decision and the soothing, comforting words of the majority, which in their own eloquent way had endeavored to mellow and if you like leave in the words of Article 43.3, the concrete facts of the case obliged the citizenry to confront the realities. And one reality was that if you ask the courts to pursue the wording and objectives of Article 43.3 with an undeviating and remorseless logic, i.e. save unborn life at all costs, save where the life of the mother is in danger, then the well woman litigation uh, and the original decision of Judge Costa in the, in the X case were the perfectly natural and, in some senses, even the inevitable byproducts of elevating the protection of unborn life to constitutional level. So, then moving on. And, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I'm not going to try and finish within the next five minutes and thank you for uh, your forbearance with me thus far. Um, here are some concluding thoughts on all of this. Um, the first is an obvious one, which is that words matter. And it's certainly true as far as the drafting of a constitutional amendment is concerned. Uh, and we as lawyers, I think, understand that intuitively, but it's not always fully understood or appreciated by non-lawyers, including sometimes politicians and other key policy makers. And I think that was true in 1983, when many of the difficulties identified by the then Attorney General, the late uh, Peter Sutherland and others were viewed as having been essentially contrived. Whereas in essence, everything that the Attorney General then said in his memoranda in uh, 1983 directed at the difficulties of the Eighth Amendment ultimately did in fact come to pass. The second thing I would say in retrospect was the parliamentary supporters of the amendment probably overplayed their hands by opting for the original wording. Uh, Peter Sutherland had suggested an alternative wording which was less overreaching, which had effectively just simply protected the existing laws against abortion from constitutional attack. Um, but the, uh, that wasn't good enough for a lot of people in 1983. They wanted a specific guarantee of the right to life of the unborn. Um, but that, I think, was always going to cause difficulties. And um, I suspect that many members of the general public would have been happy with a largely ornamental style anti-abortion clause uh, of this nature, albeit one that uh, safeguarded the existing abortion law 
from a row and weight style challenge. But once you go further and treat the right to the life of the unborn as, as enjoying positive constitutional status, a whole new range of novel and potential legal issues were ushered forth. And as Professor Delandres has said, um, although it was originally thought that Article 43 dealt solely with abortion, its wording was clearly capable of wider application. Not only does Article 43 prohibit the introduction of widely available abortion, but establishes an autonomous constitutional right to life of the fetus. And then moving on now, the, um, the next slide. Um, there was always going to be difficulties. What did the word um, unborn mean? Uh, there was also an absence of medical or scientific cons consensus as to when life begins. And it's not even clear that the courts could ever have determined this um, because they didn't have the resources available to them whereby they could determine when does life begin because that's a matter of scientific and philosophical debate and can't really be resolved in a court of law. Moreover, how can you meaningfully speak of an equal right to life of the mother and the unborn? Since by definition, if matters ever had to be put to a test, the choice between the two would have to be made. So the Third, the unspoken premise of the, uh, of the amendment, the protection of unborn life, almost at all costs, save for the life of the mother was at stake, was always going to present its own difficulties. And this was illustrated in the PP case in 2014, where a mother had died, a uh, pregnant mother had died um, uh, with the fetus uh, at about 18 weeks, and the, uh, and the question was whether the courts, as it were, could require the hospital to keep the, although there was a brainstem death, to keep the physical body going in an artificial way so that you got to 25, 26, 27, 28 weeks so that the fetus could be delivered. And the, the court rejected, the High Court rejected that on the facts, but clearly left open the possibility that if, for example, um, the, a pregnant mother had suffered this collapse at age uh, at 28 or 29 or 30 weeks, you could have had the prospect of her body being kept artificially alive in that sense uh, to enable the uh, fetus to be, to be delivered. Um, in any event, the premise is that there is always a clear and easily definable difference in life and health of the expectant mother. But medical experience has demonstrated that that's simply not so. And in the words of Dr. Rona Mahoney, if the legal world explores the balance of rights, the medical world um, explores the balance of risk. And she said the Eighth Amendment really doesn't factor that into account. And then if we just go then to the next slide. Um, and so here, ladies and gentlemen, I conclude with this. Um, contrast once again the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution and the wording of Article 43.1 and 43.2 of ours. Maybe it wasn't fully realized in 1937, but the wording of our provisions in particular do give the Irish courts even wider powers of judicial review than that accorded to their US counterparts. And in some ways, therefore, it's striking that the US Supreme Court has gone further in terms of judicial decision making, given the more slender basis of the 14th Amendment. And you might find it curious and odd to say so, but in January 1973, the US Supreme Court might have been better, indeed far better, able to justify its decision in Roe and Wade had it the greater firepower of Article 43.1 and Article 43.2, or for that matter, ancillary provisions such as the dignity clause in the preamble or the provisions relating to the family in Article 41 at, at its disposal. And if the supporters of the Eighth Amendment had all too casually dismissed the legal objections of the Attorney General, Sutherland and others with dogmatic assertions as to what the legal implications of Article 43.3 would be, and in that respect, it was um, Attorney General Sutherland uh, has had the verdict of history uh, and not them. Um, perhaps though, they were more correct than their anti-amendment counterparts in understanding intuitively that in some circumstances, Article 43.1 and 43.2 did in fact go further than the 14th Amendment on which Griswold uh, the, uh, and Rowan Wade had rested. And so ladies and gentlemen, 
um, I thank you for your forbearance. And I remark with this, I can close, close my talk by remarking that this trilogy of remarkable cases in their own way illustrate that the, um, uh, the text of the, the express text of the constitution contains its own paradox because it's the very strength of the express text of the constitution has proved to be its greatest weakness. It was at its heart too radical a document fully and easily to be incorporated into a legal system which had for hundreds of years rested on the bedrock of the common law and a more modest judicial approach to the resolution of these contentious social issues. And I contend that by looking at these three cases and the dialogue and dispute um, in the Supreme Court in, in those three cases, and contrasting that with the uh, 14th Amendment basis from Griswold and Rowan Wade is in its own way illustrative of that proposition. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your forbearance. And next time, I hope it will be in person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, come in now with a few of the questions that are coming in. So there's a, a few themes coming through in the questions. And one of those themes, um, Advocate General, is around the, I'm going to pick out one question, but four or five questions on a similar th issue. And it's talking about the issue of derived rights versus unenumerated rights. And given that the derived rights approach advocated, this is from Conor O'Mahony, but he's covering three or four people here, I think. Um, he said that advocation, the Friends of the Irish Environment case, allows for reliance on extremely vague and broad textual hooks like human dignity. To what extent does it really provide more constraint on judges than the unenumerated rights approach? Um, it's a huge question, and I'll probably get into difficulties and trouble if I were to if I was to give a full and complete answer. But I, I suppose, um, you know, I'm a textualist. Um, I'm not an originalist, which is you'd look at what was said in 1937, and that is controlling. But I, I tend to be by nature a textualist. I want to see the text because that's something that can tell me objectively or sort of objectively what I'm supposed to do. Because, you know, as a judge or indeed an advocate general, nobody ever voted for me. And if they knew that they wouldn't ever do so. So um, I only have to give effect really to the, I'm trying to give effect both whether it was in Dublin or in Luxembourg to what I perceive to be the authentic voice of the people as expressed in their uh, representatives, uh, their elected representatives. And, and, you know, in Ireland, it's, you know, the, an act of the Oireachtas, the constitution, you know, at a European Union level, it's legislation and directives and the, the, the treaty provisions themselves. And one is trying to do the one's best to give effect to that. And um, I mean, um, Conor Mahoney makes a great point. I suppose that all I would just simply say is this, is that, um, uh, I, I think, with respect, the Chief Justice in Friends of the Irish Environment was correct in saying that uh, the unenumerated rights doctrine may give the impression that judges are completely at large in deciding what rights are to be protected. And I think that would be, uh, I'm at one with him, if I may say so, in saying that that would be wrong. Um, but, you know, it is, after all, a constitution we're interpreting. And I think it's very easy to say that, um, you know, if this protection of the family in Article 41, that necessarily implies a, a certain degree of autonomy and privacy for the family. Otherwise, Article 41 is meaningless. And I would endeavor and defend many of these derivative rights on that basis. I think, you know, you might say it's a slender distinction in some respects, I agree, but it is a distinction and an important one. And it's also one that endeavors at least to start the debate with a text. I'm going to kind of follow this one up again because it was a question that came to my mind as I was listening to you, but fortunately somebody else has asked it, so now I can legitimately put it to you. If there is a difference between derivative rights and unenumerated rights, which unenumerated rights would not survive under the analysis of a derivative right? Um, I think I can invoke the pass uh, at that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so I have another one here from Sarah Reed BL, and she'd like to, well, thank you for the talk, but she wants to ask where you think the balance should lie in drafting new provisions of the constitution, noting that the text itself was central to McGee compared with the US text in Griswold. 
Um, but further, where we appear to be moving towards derived rights rather than the unenumerated rights. So her question is, should we ensure the wording of a proposed provision in the constitutional referenda are approached in this way going forward? Well, um, yeah, it's kind of difficult to answer that question. The abstract. Yeah. What I would say is this: is that I mean, the, if there are any future constitutional amendments, obviously, both in the past, present, and future, the wording is is critical, and um, you know, it shouldn't be perhaps simply left to lawyers, but a law, a legal input as to the Im import of the words is is vital because any, uh, I mean, any constitutional amendment has downstream consequences. So for example, um, the Equal Rights Amendment has already, the, equal, the, the, the Marriage Equality Amendment has had other consequences beyond just simply guaranteeing the right to gay people to get married. Uh, it is also meant, as Supreme Court pointed out, that the traditional views uh, in the old common law definition of marriage is no longer opposite. So, um, uh, uh, I personally think that, you know, there's been significant constitutional amendments and it's now time maybe to consolidate what we have, that some of the things that were perhaps less suited to a modern society are no longer with us, but there's a lot that, in my view, but it's only a purely personal view, uh, there's a lot which is suited to a modern society and uh, I, I'm not sure that far-reaching constitutional change at this point is necessary or required. But that's a purely personal, subjective view on which many, many people can have different views. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question just in relation to, um, sorry, now I have actually lost the question. I had it there a moment ago. So I'm gonna go back up to another question that came in, in relation to Fleming versus Ireland, which was, I know not one of the cases you refer to, but they said, uh, in this case, it's probably to be regarded as part of a series along with Simpson, Friends of the Irish Environment and other similar cases. They hold that the human personality protected by the Constitution is not a libertarian concept, as this would clearly be in conflict with the general scheme of the Constitution in relation to rights. What other implications does the Advocate General think that might have beyond ruling out assistance in committing suicide? Well, um, look, I'm, I'm not going to get into the question okay. of suicide or... Yes or any of that, because that's a live controversial topic in this yeah. country, and I, I prefer not to answer that. No, and that's absolutely also, fair enough. So I was the a member of the High Court in the Fleming case, so I just prefer not to comment on that if you don't mind. No, that's not a problem at all. Um, and I'm just going down here to the case. Are you surprised that other rights, um, and I think you probably know the answer to this, are you surprised that other potential unenumerated rights, for example, like the right to have a home haven't been litigated in the same way that the right to life has been litigated. So kind of on a, the socioeconomic rights, I suppose. Well, again, look, I, I prefer that again, okay, that's, that's a very controversial topic and it's one of big political import of present in the state. And I, I prefer not to comment on that. Uh, what I would just simply say is this, is, is that, um, um, with great respect, the Friends of the Irish Environment approach provides a very coherent template in respect of these derived rights. And it is an approach with which, with, with great respect, I, I, I think mm -hmm. is, is the correct reading of the interpretation uh, of the constitution and perhaps rebalances a slightly wrong interpretation come impression which Ryan and the Attorney General may have given. And that's all I feel I can say about that rather than going beyond into specific issues of controversy. Okay, no, no problem at all. Uh, there's, there's one here as well, which talks about the difference, for example, and what do you think of the difference between the way in which the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment has developed compared to the similar clause in article 40.1 of our constitution, that difference between the interpretation. Is this, or am I bringing you into all the dangerous territory? I think here? you are. <laughs> you okay, are. sorry. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm bringing... to say is that, look, I've given various decisions in the High Court on this topic and okay. they reflect my views, but I don't want to say anything further than no, that. No, and that's fair enough. There's one of the ones here, which I think is probably uh, safe enough. I'm hoping now, anyhow, uh, it's safe enough territory. And it's talking about that, that Americans would consider themselves as a nation to be conservative. 
Um, and they're wondering why, on the other hand, they consider Ireland considers itself to be kind of liberalizing itself significantly. And how long do you think it will be that it is appropriate to let US jurisprudence inform Irish judicial opinion? Well, I think that there is, um, uh, uh, I'm a huge admirer of the US Supreme Court. Uh, and I think the US Supreme Court has made an enormous contribution to Western legal thought. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, I think the judgments of the dissenting, great dissenting judgments in the free speech cases of Holmes and Brandeis are some of the greatest landmarks uh, uh, and greatest judgments ever delivered in, a, in a, an English, in the English speaking world. Uh, and so I'm a huge admirer of the US Supreme Court. And uh, I think the US constitutional tradition is a great deal to teach us. And there are huge similarities between the wording, the, the history, the common law tradition between the two constitutions in a way that I think not enough people, both in the United States or in Ireland, recognize or give credit. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to bring into here one as well, uh, which is on the talk and it's on the Norris case. Um, and it's specifically talking about the majority um, as an example of how the preamble is an uncertain textual foundation for derived rights. Mm -hmm. So if you take a broad textual construction of the common good, prudence, justice, charity, and the dignity and freedom of the inter individual, is that at all different from discovering unenumerated rights like Ryan? So this is similar to Conor Romani's question at the start. I mean, I, I personally think it is, but I take the questioner's point. But I do think there is a distinction, however slender, because at least you are with some text basis, you're on dry land. Whereas if you like um, complete unenumerated rights, you're in the water, even if you are, you know, only up to your knees. And that's the distinction, really, if you like. And so there's a follow on from that really is as a textualist, what practical significance to you uh, do you accord to the text implicit acknowledgement of natural law? I mean, it references natural law that are antecedent and superior to all positive laws. So I mean, what, what would significance would you give to that? Well, I think that as a textualist, you have to give it, you have to reflect that that uh, is the, you know, the, the intellectual tradition against which the constitution is enacted. But ultimately, as the Supreme Court pointed out in the abortion information reference in 1995, the court has never said that natural law is superior to the text. It ultimately is the text that counts. And you have to give a holistic and sensible interpretation to the text as a whole. And that has to be the starting point, whether it's the constitution, the EU treaties, uh, you know, a regulation dealing with animal waste or, you know, an act of the Oireachtas. It all comes back in my book uh, to the to a text because that has to be the starting point for any judge or judicial figure because nobody voted for us. I, I, I would absolutely agree. I'm, I'm looking at some of the other questions here and I think we're probably heading into territory that uh, we don't want to go. So I there is one of going to be about constitutional history. So <laughs> I'm safe. I, I, I'm looking at some of the questions and they're asking you about the current Supreme Court. So I might I might avoid those one. <laughs> um, but what I was going to uh, and maybe there is one here at the at the outset. Um, and I'm just trying to get it. And it came in from Facebook Live and it was asking you, what do you what does Advocate General Hogan think about the argument? that the court's approach in McGee was not necessarily in conflict with Catholic social teaching, but in many ways it was deeply rooted in Catholic natural law tradition. So part of the thematic tradition involves wide scope for familial marital autonomy, which is what you've referred to already, and cautions against criminalizing consensual private conduct and does not systemically harm the common good. So this is because the state's enforcement of such conduct may overly oppress other, good, other important issues such as flourishing of a political community like fam familial freedom and subsidiarity. Okay, I can't comment really mm. on, um, if you like, the theological aspects of that. All that I would say is, is that um, whether it is religiously inspired or secular, it's clear that Article 41 goes a long, long way to protect the autonomy of the family and marital privacy. That's Those are the unspoken and indeed at times spoken premises against which Article 41 operates. And, 
you know, it may have been a surprise, it was a huge surprise thing for many people in 1973 for the Supreme Court to say it actually engages uh, at this level, uh, but it, it's a perfectly logical, I would say perfectly logical consequence uh, of uh, Article 41, albeit one that perhaps required a good deal of judicial imagination and bravery in 1973 in a very, very different Ireland. Great. I'm going to, because I, I, I am going to say, well, thank you very much. Um, one of the, the last questions I'll leave here is that, firstly, thanking you again. The comments coming in are, are very positive about a great lecture. Um, do you consider that the European constitutional traditions might have relevance for the interpretation of the Irish constitutional values going forward, particularly now that you're based in Luxembourg yourself? Well, whatever about me being based in Luxembourg myself, um, I have always contended uh, that um, the, there is a connection between the wording of the constitution in 1937 and indeed going back to the 1922 constitution, which expressly borrowed from a number of interwar constitutional uh, provisions. Um, I mean, a very, very good example is Article 40, Section 5, which is almost a direct translation of Article 115 of the 1919 Weimar Constitution of Germany, which in turn is borrowed from uh, provisions of the of French constitutions uh, from one from 1852. So there is a long connection uh, um, between the text of the Irish Constitution and some of these interwar constitutions. And if I could just make one final more general point, mm -hmm. which is I think that a lot of the criticism of the constitution is with respect misplaced, because I understand it, of course, uh, but people were focusing, it's easy for non-lawyers to focus on the decorative provisions of the constitution to which they can point to very easily and say, that's wrong or it's not in accord with contemporary social values. Um, and I, I, I mean, I couldn't disagree with that. I mean, just to take a historical example, the recognition of the special provision of the Catholic Church as guardian the faith of, of the, the people, that was largely a decorative provision. Uh, it reflected similar decorative provisions in many other European constitutions in 1937. But you could point to it and say, wait a minute, we can't, you know, this constitution really uh, you know, I'm not a religious person, so therefore what's in this constitution for me? And a lot of people took that view. But, but if you look beyond the decorative provisions, and most of them, not all of them, are now gone, it's the beating heart of the constitution in Article 40, that's the critical, and Article 41, that's the critical, and Article 42, that's the critical bit in terms of contemporary constitutional law. And there you will find close, close connections with both the in old interwar constitutions of Europe, which in turn influenced the modern um, European constitutional law and the corresponding provisions of the US constitution. Thank you very much. And I definitely don't want to get you into any trouble. So I'm going to avoid some of the other questions coming up and I will hand you back over to Siobhan on that note. Thank you so much, it was brilliant. Um, thank you very much. Advocate General Hogan, uh, thank you to all of our participants. Um, thank you to my colleague, Dr. Siobhan Quinlivan. Uh, we can see in the chat that there are many other questions coming in uh, and we're delighted to have welcomed so many participants this evening. Uh, a particular thank you though to our speaker this evening, to Advocate General Hogan for bringing us from the Brandenburg Concertos to Modern Musicology. Uh, for highlighting and bringing together the threads and links uh, from the constitutional traditions of the US, Harlan due process through Griswold, McGee, Roe, X case, NHV, up to the Friends of the Irish Environment, uh, and really bringing us back to the richness of the constitutional text and its potential uh, and the richness of the processes of constitutional interpretation. Um, speaking this summer, uh, Advocate General Hogan, presenting at the Hardiman Summer Lecture Series, he commented on and reflected on his four favorite judges and on the judicial qualities and legal writing uh, that he admired. And I know that I'm speaking for many of us here this evening, uh, that uh, Advocate General Hogan displays uh, 
the judicial qualities and legal writing um, that we greatly admire, um, but also a, a generosity in terms of insight and reflection uh, and a depth of knowledge of uh, historical traditions and constitutional uh, jurisprudence that we are greatly for, very grateful for. Um, so thank you again uh, this evening for sharing those insights with us. And we're delighted to have the full text of this evening's lecture uh, and a recording that will be made available to all of you as well. And I certainly hope next time that we will be together uh, in person and we'll have uh, an opportunity to, to thank you and to express our hospitality. So thank you again and uh, good night to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you and safe home to everyone. Good night. Thank you, Jared. I think that's... Yeah, listen, I'm still here. Okay, yeah, great.